I was uh, telling some of the ladies before study that um, my Monday today was uh, filled with a lot of, I don't know, just uh, impatient moments with my kids in school and everything. It seemed like everything I told them to do, they just cried or, what? Or it was just one of those days where they weren't happy with every decision I made. So all day long, it was just butting heads. And then I had some work that I had to do. And um, it was just one of those days where everything just felt intense. And then um, just ungracious, I guess, on my part. So I was telling the ladies, I was praying on my way over here. All right, Lord. Like, I don't want to come across as Mama Bear tonight. Just pounding in the words. So I'm going to try to hold back. Because I feel like even tonight's lesson that we have with this woman of God, God makes his words so clear. And he gives us instructions sometimes that are so clear. And we have the choice to either do it or not. And there are consequences to our decisions. There are consequences of blessing and goodness when we do those things God asks us to do. And then there's the not so fun consequences when we choose not to do the things God wants us to do. So I'm going to try not to come across as that, come on kids, kind of mom tonight. But if it comes across a little bit that way, Maybe the Lord just gave me that day on purpose because he wants to drive it home. So uh, we were speaking last week as we were speaking about um, Deborah and uh, uh, about the time of the judges, right? So we're in this Old Testament period of time where it is just a mess in Israel. It is turbulent. It is just terrible because as we've seen during this time of the judges, Israel was consistently inconsistent. They would follow the Lord when there was a good, strong leader, and they would do it his way, and then they'd get comfortable, and they would stop following the Lord and doing what he wanted. And then God would put them in slavery or, you know, uh, having to pay tribute to another nation or something. And then they would get so sick and tired of it that they would turn back to the Lord and be with God for a while, and then they would give up again. I mean, it was constant, right? There's all these dark, dark stories in there. Uh, tonight's lesson takes place during the time of Judges. So I want you to open not to the book of Judges, but to the book of Ruth. Okay? Open up your Bibles. It's right next to Judges. So once you get to uh, Joshua, then Judges, then Ruth. Right? Ruth is the next little book right after that. Uh, now tonight, we're not going to talk about Ruth. <laughs> I feel like there's a little bait and switch. Right? Right? I'm putting you in the book of Ruth, but we're going to talk about Ruth next time we're together. Uh, and we're going to talk about her and actually another woman in the scripture whose story ties in with hers a little bit. Uh, there's a little sneak peek for you. Now, again, it's not going to be next week because we're not going to have study next week. Okay, it's Valentine's, so be with your husbands, be with your spouses. Girls, if you're single, have a Galentine's, right? You and your gal pals go out or even better, Order in, take out your Bible, put a candle up, and you and Jesus spend a dinner together. Okay, the love of your soul who loves you more than anyone else. Um, but when we get back together, we'll talk about Ruth. This week, we're going to talk a bit about Naomi. Naomi is another main character in this story of Ruth. Uh, so let me go ahead and just read to you in this book of Ruth, chapter 1. Let's read verses 1 and 2. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Verse 2 says the name of that man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to the country of Moab and remained there. So let's pause there for just a second. Uh, I want to read to you really quickly about this time, this period. There's a famine in Israel. And we think, wait a minute. Isn't this supposed to be the land flowing with milk and honey? What happened? Where'd the bees go? What happened to all the cows? Why is there no milk and honey in the promised land? Why is there a famine in God's country? Well, I'm going to be flipping back and forth a bit between the book of Ruth and the book of Deuteronomy because I have some scriptures that coincide with this. So I'm going to read to you real quick out of the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 11. I'm going to read to yourselves 
uh, read to yourselves. I'm going to read to you verses 16 and 17. This is what God had told his people, okay? In verse 16, he said, Take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Lest the Lord your God's anger be aroused against you, and he shut up the heavens so there be no rain, and the land yield no pro produce, and you perish quickly from the good land which the Lord your God is giving you. God told them, hey, if you start worshiping other gods and you allow your hearts to be pulled away from me, I will shut up the heavens. I will stop allowing the ground to produce for you. There will be famine. So now we're seeing one of these times, one of these seasons of famine in the land of Israel because the Israelites were not walking with the Lord. And the Lord, as good and gracious as he is, will take things from our life to wake us up, to turn us around, to get us to follow him. Well, this man, Elimelech, thought, all right, Israel's not doing well. And instead of repenting and turning back to God, he decides, my family and I are going to leave. We're going to go find green pasture somewhere else. If God won't give it to us, maybe we can find it in the land of Moab. So we're going to leave God's land and go to this other place. Where, of course, they worship idols and whatever, right? Moab was not a good place to be spiritually. But he thought, all right, let's go down there. We sometimes can think we can move away from our problems. We think the grass is greener, right? At uh, a different job, at a different relationship, in a different home. We think, oh, if only I could have that thing, it would all be better. No, you know why? Because you take you with it. You take you with you to another church. And then you realize, oh man, this other church has problems. I should go find another church. Okay, so you go to the other church. Well, guess what? You're the one going and you're bringing your problems with you. Your problems will chase you. Elimelech and Naomi and their family were not going to find a better place away from God's people, even though they thought that this was what would solve their problems. Now, we don't know how Naomi felt about this move. We don't know if she was like, honey, this is not a good idea, you know. <sighs> Maybe she was being that submissive wife and going along with it. I don't think so. And one of the reasons I don't think so is because of the next verse. In Ruth, uh, sorry, I need to have a marker here because I might be flipping back here. Whoop, let's put that there. That's what these are for, you know, in your Bibles? They're like bookmarks? Yeah, you knew that. Okay, so in verse 3 of Ruth chapter 1, it says, then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. Verse 4, now they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. So Elimelech, they get to this new land, and Elimelech immediately dies. He dies there. Now, I feel like if Ruth or if Naomi had not been part of this decision, she would have packed up and gone back home. You know, I, that just makes sense to me. Instead, she stays in the land here for 10 years. And not only that, she gives her sons local women from Moab to marry. And you think, well, what's the big deal there? Back in Deuteronomy, I'm going to read you another verse, okay? Now I'm going to Deuteronomy chapter 7. God's word said this. He's giving his people instructions in Israel, okay? He's telling them the do's and don'ts of what I want you to do. He says in Deuteronomy 7 verse 3, Nor shall you make marriages with them. It's talking about the foreigners, right, in the land. You shall not give your daughter to their son, nor take their daughter for your son. Why? Verse 4, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. So the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. Naomi 
Now, back then, before we think, oh, well, these are grown boys. You know, they're going to pick whoever they want to. It's not like our culture. Our culture, we, are, we allow our children to marry whom they want to marry. You know, we try to strongly guide them in the direction we want them to go, right? Ooh, boy's not good for you. You know, or that girl, she's a, woo, uh, okay, right? You know, we try, we try as moms, as parents. Um, thankfully, I'm not there yet. My kids are 10 and 8 and 6, but I'm already like girls. You be watching for those boys, you know. But, um, but back then in this culture, the parents arranged marriages. The parents put the children together. And so even with her husband gone, I, I can't imagine that Naomi didn't have a big hand in choosing these women for her sons. It was against what God had said, right? Um, now let's talk about this move. Whether she was the instigator or the follower, Naomi allowed her family to walk away from the Lord, both literally and morally. Okay, literally. Moab is literally downhill from Israel <laughs> the whole way. You go from Jerusalem, Bethlehem to Moab, it's a downhill trek. And ladies, isn't walking away from the Lord always a downhill, right? Not only spiritually and whatever, but it seems like it's so easy. It's so easy to walk away from the Lord. It is. And to get into all those things that the world has for us. Um, Naomi found it easy, right? Easy to go on to down into Moab. Uh, but also morally, because they willingly chose to do something God had said not to do. I think of girls that I knew in high school and even in college who willingly dated non-Christian boys. They knew that they knew that they knew that these boys that they were attracted to, that they allowed themselves to go on dates with and fall in love with eventually, eventually were not men who followed God. They, had, they wanted nothing to do with the Lord. And, you know, sometimes they had their reasonings of, oh, but he'll come to church with me. And, you know, all those stupid reasons we give ourselves to try to justify it when God says very specifically that being unequally yoked is not for us. We are not to have a relationship with someone who doesn't love God, who doesn't love Jesus, who isn't born again. Why? Because you'll pull in different directions. That's what Deuteronomy was saying. He was, in Deuteronomy 7, God was saying, if you allow this relationship, they will pull them away from me. That's why I don't want you to do it. You know, it's not because I'm like, you know, whatever. I'm not that bossy. It's not just because I'm being bossy. It's because I have a purpose. I want you to walk with me, and I want them to walk with me, and I want you pulling together toward me, right? And yet, when we don't do it, there are consequences. Now, before you think God's rules are just totally unfair, I want to read you another part of Deuteronomy 7. Uh, this is in verse 6. God tells them why he's giving them all these rules, right? In chapter 7, verse 6 of Deuteronomy, he says this, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you or choose you because you were more in number than any other people, um, for you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. God is saying, I want to be faithful to you, and I want to love you, and I want to keep you safe, and you're my special treasure. So yes, because I have chosen you, I've given you rules. <laughs> I've given you, I kept thinking of Spider-Man, and not the new dumb Spider-Mans. I'm talking about the really good ones when I was in high school, you know, the Tobey Maguire ones, um, because those were the good Spider-Mans, okay? I know, Lindsay's back there going, what? Lindsay, you're a baby, okay? You just, nope, I'm just telling you, I'm just telling you, the old ones were better. It's just nostalgia, right? It's because it was what was there when I was a kid. But I remember Uncle Ben sitting Tobey Maguire down and saying, with great power comes great responsibility, right? And I keep thinking of that as I'm doing this. And I'm like, Lord, you have called us to be your people, to be identified by your name. Christian is a badge we wear. But because we wear that badge, because we choose to be his children, we're supposed to be different. 
We're supposed to follow his rules for life, not what the world tells us to do. We're supposed to willingly make ourselves not like everyone else. Oh, man, it's hard as a kid when you're that way, right? When you're a Christian kid growing up and your mom and dad say, mm, that movie's not for us. Or I know all your friends are going here, but we're not going to do that. And kids say, why? It's not fair. So-and-so does it. I was like, all right, guys, I just need you to know, you're not so-and-so. And And every little kid's like, "Mm, I wish I was in so-and-so's house because they get to do whatever they want to. And you're trying to teach them as kids that, you guys, this is just not us. This is not our family. We're not identifying this way. We don't say this is okay. We don't go this direction. We don't. And you try to teach them why. Because they're supposed to be different. Being different is hard. Oh, my gosh, especially as a kid, especially as a teenager, high school. Oh, my gosh, being different is the, right, it's the, the black X on your <laughs> reputation, and you're just automatically set aside. But truly, truly, God says that black X is so good because it shows everyone that you're not like everyone else. Well, I don't think Naomi did that very well. I don't think her family did that very well. I think they saw in their minds, all right, there's no food here. We're going to leave and go there. And not only that, but while we're here, let's go ahead and marry some girls that are from here, right? Orpah and Ruth, uh, these Moabitess women. God's rules are because he loves us. We are supposed to be special. We are supposed to be different. (sighs) Naomi's story shows us another one of those patterns from Scripture, right? Her story shows us that if we walk away from the Lord, we will experience those bad consequences. All these things, you can go through the book of Deuteronomy and see all the cursings that God said he would bring on his people if they didn't follow him. Um, In these 10 years, I just want to say one other thing. It wasn't an easy, good 10 years. It really wasn't. We're going to see some other parts of that in a minute. But her family experienced a famine of a totally different kind. A famine away from God's blessing, away from God's peace, away from God's hand of protection, And one thing that you notice, it doesn't say it specifically in here, but you notice it, her sons in these 10 years with these other wives never had kids. None of them. There were no children. There was no fruit either from Naomi or from either of her sons and their sons' wives in those 10 years. Having no children in that culture was massive. It's not like their culture today where everyone waits till they're 50 to have kids. And I'm like, have you had a kid? Like these ladies who are like, no, we'll wait. I'm like, you don't understand how hard that is on your body to have a child. And then you want to do it when you're 50 or you're 45. Like I had all my kids. I, I, I got married and then I waited, right? Because I got married when I was a baby. So Mark and I married when we were babies. Um, and it, <laughs> truly, we were really young. He was 20 and I was 21. So I had to rent our hotels because Mark wasn't old enough for our honeymoon. Um, And rental cars, like through our first few years of marriage, I always had to do it because I'm older than he is by like six months. But I still rub it in that I'm older. Um, But we got married again, again, 20 and 21. And so we knew we were young. We didn't want to have kids right away. But (laughs) by the time I hit like 25, 26, I'm like, all right, let's get this ball a rolling. You know, I don't want to be, you know... (laughs) I just didn't want to be old and have babies. It's hard. It's hard enough being young, having kids, being really old and having kids. It's not a choice then. Back then, you got married to have children. It was where inheritances come from, and they were the ones taking care of you when you were older. I mean, you needed children. They were important in that culture. So the fact that there were none in any of their families, I don't know. I think that's quite telling. I think that's the hand of the Lord not being on this family of blessing because children are a blessing. Let me say that. Um, Okay, let's read verse 5 in Ruth. Now what happens? Verse 5. Then both Malon and Chilion, Naomi's sons, also died. So the women, the woman survived her two sons and her husband. Now, we're going to get into this in a little bit, and we're going to talk about how how Naomi recognized that the hand of the Lord was against her. But I just want to say one quick note as I'm talking about these consequences and things. Not all suffering is a consequence, okay? And if if you need more on that, go to the book of Job. Job did not suffer because Job had done anything wrong. I'm not talking about that. 
okay? And you can't always judge when you look at someone's life why they're suffering, okay? You can't say, oh, you're suffering because you wore that miniskirt to church on Sunday. So God is slapping you upside the head. We're so quick to do that, aren't we? We can come up with a reason why God's judging them. You don't know what it is, so keep that to yourself, okay? Job, don't be one of Job's friends who was telling him all the reasons why he was suffering and none of them were right and God had to tell him, shut up, you friends. You have no clue what I'm doing in Job's life, okay? Don't be the kind of person that God has to tell you to shut up because you're judge, being judgmental, okay? But in Naomi's life, there was consequences to her actions. Do you see the difference? Okay, we're talking about earned consequences, not God is using suffering for a purpose, okay? So there is a difference here. Now, her sons die, and Naomi's life in Moab pretty much dies with them. There's no reason to stay now. Uh, walking out of obedience, walking out of obedience with God, walking into sin, will always result in pain and loss. Always. And now Naomi and her two daughter-in-laws find themselves in the lowest, most disadvantaged class of the ancient world. Uh, and what I am happy to say is that at this point, after verse 5, this is the lowest Naomi will go. This is the darkest moment of her story here. She doesn't know it, but she's at a stop sign right here. God has planted a big, fat stop sign in her path. Now, she has a choice. She can choose to stop and then keep going the same way she's been going. She can choose to walk farther away from the Lord, to take these losses and to take this consequence and say, forget it. I don't want anything to do with a God who would do this to me and go farther. Walk into bitterness and walk into a life, the rest of her life without him. Thankfully, she doesn't do that. She takes this moment and this stop sign that God plants in her life and she decides to treat it as a U-turn an opportunity to U-turn. Now, that's one thing I love about God. All of his stop signs that he plants in our life are opportunities for U-turns, right? I hate it when you need the U-turn and you come to the perfect spot and then you see that cursed sign up at the top that says no U-turn. Uh, have you ever had that family member who chooses not to see that U-turn sign? <laughs> well, God's stop signs always have a U-turn. You always have the chance to turn around and walk the other direction. Uh, Let's read what Naomi did. Verse 6. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. Moab, For she had heard in the, all the way down there in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore, she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. This was a big decision. And it wasn't just Naomi going home to her family. It was Naomi going back to the land of God, back to his people, back to his promises, back to him. Okay? God had visited his people with bread. I just want to note really quick that the people who had stayed in Israel during the famine now have God's provision. Sometimes when we think God's not blessing, God's not doing, I need to go find it somewhere else. No, you need to stay and wait for the Lord to provide. We're going to talk in uh, next time together about a man named Boaz. Now, Boaz had remained in Bethlehem for these 10 years, and we see that God had blessed him with, with riches, with wealth, with servants, with land, with grain. And you think, well, you know, why is he so blessed? Maybe because he stayed. Maybe because he turned his heart back to the Lord instead of running away from his problem, okay? So the ones who stayed were blessed. And Naomi hears through the grapevine that back in Israel, things are better. And she wants some of this goodness for herself. A couple good things that I like to note. Naomi didn't just hope and pray that her situation would change while she was there in Moab. She didn't. She got up and she started walking toward God's blessing in his place. If you're in a place right now where you're dry and you're just not seeing God's blessing and you've walked away or whatever, don't sit where you are and think, God, can you just fix this? 
I know I'm in this horrible relationship. Can you just make it better? And God says, no, you need to get out of it and walk away from it and come back to me. Okay, I'm not talking about marriages. If you have marriages, let's talk about counseling first, okay? But uh, I'm talking about boyfriend-girlfriend kind of thing, or I'm talking about a friend relationship or something that's pulling you down. Instead of staying there and saying, oh, God fixed my problem. No, get up and turn and walk toward him. Do that walk of obedience that he's been telling you to do first, right? I like that about Naomi. She didn't just wish for the good to happen to her. She fixed it. And she did something about it. She set out to receive God's blessing. I just love that. I think that's cool. Also, uh, oh yeah, let's keep reading. Let's read what she says here too. Verse 8. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, now realize they're on the way. They're walking with her. And as they're going, Naomi says, I don't know if this is a good idea that they come with me. So let's stop, stop for half a second. This is where I'm going. But girls, I need to talk to you for a second. She realizes something. When you turn back to the Lord, you can't always force someone to go with you. I'm talking about that relationship, right? Just because God's calling you back doesn't mean he's necessarily calling all your friend group back or your relationship group back or whoever it is. Maybe he's just calling you. So Naomi's going to pause and give her daughters the opportunity to go back home to Moab. That's where they're from. That's their family, right? She's like, I can't take them with me. So it says in verse 8, Naomi said to her two daughters, go, go. Return each of you to your mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. When she's saying, may you find rest in the house of your husband, she's saying, I want you to have a secure rest and security. Those two words are intertwined. And and it means I want you to go find a place right? Because that's where a woman had security, was in marriage, was connected to a family. She's saying, I want you to find that security, and I know you're going to find it back home, so go and find that, right? And they all wept because they all loved each other, and they didn't necessarily want to be parted. Verse 10, and they said to her, surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husband's? We are going to talk about this a lot more next time together as we talk about this this rule that God had put in place to help families, to help protect families. Basically, if you had a son and that son died, one of your other sons was obligated to marry, you know, their sister-in-law so that they could have a baby and that would still continue the line of that son who died so that that line wouldn't die out. God had a whole plan for that. And Naomi's saying, guys, I can't have, you know, I'm going to, like, I'm going to have another kid and you're going to wait for them and marry them. It's not going to happen. Go back home, right? Uh, Verse 12, go turn back, my daughters, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters. For it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, basically. But Ruth clung to her. Let's pause there. Now, I think it's interesting. Naomi sees that the hand of the Lord has gone out against her. But she's not saying that as a blaming way. She's not saying, look what God has done to me and to my sons. She says, I have not been walking with the Lord, and God has rightly been punishing me. We know that because if she was bitter against the Lord, she would have gone straight through that stop sign and walked farther away. Instead, she's turning back to him, recognizing, God, I've been wrong, and I've seen these things in my life, and I know that you're against me, so I'm turning back to you just as you promised to turn back to me if I turn back to you, right? So she's saying, yes, I recognize I was wrong, and the things happening to me are wrong too. She doesn't play the victim card. Oh, woe is me. God never does anything good for me. Everything bad happens to me. Wah, 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 wah. You guys have friends like that where everything is, oh, God is against me, and I can't believe this, and I can't believe that, and mama. Really? Like, you don't have any responsibility in any of the bad things happening to you? Well, maybe. I did comment on that Facebook page, and 
chewed that girl out, and I just can't believe she's persecuting me. Oh, brother, right? I love that we don't see that with Naomi. She fully is owning up to why that punishment is against her. But one thing that I'm a little sad about here, and maybe it's because she's, she's hurting, okay? Her sons are dead. Her chance at grandchildren, gone. She's going back to her homeland, but she's got nothing she's taking back with her, right? She's broken. And maybe it's because of her brokenness that she leans on what the world would see as the best option for her daughters-in-law. The world would say, your best option is to go back home and get remarried and have children and all that. That seems reasonable. But I don't think that her best for them was necessarily God's best for them. Wouldn't you say, hey, you're going back to God. Bring these girls with you. Bring them with you to the Lord. Who knows what God can do? And that's where the rest of the story comes in, right? Thankfully, Ruth makes that decision for her. Ruth chooses to come back to, to go to the land of God. And, and it's incredible what happens to Ruth. While she should have only found a husband back home in Moab and had a family, God gives her a husband and a family in the new land because God's plans, we can't even see him sometimes. So I wish Naomi had brought Orpah with her too. I wish she had pulled her along with her. You know, we never hear of Orpah again. Orpah kisses her mother-in-law and goes back home. She's out of the story now. And I always wonder, oh man, what would have happened if she had come too? Mm, in her brokenness, Naomi was only doing what looked right at that moment. Uh, but let me say this in this moment. Ten years, David Gusick said this, ten years of Naomi's compromise in Moab never made Ruth confess her allegiance to the God of Israel. Yet, as soon as Naomi stood and said, I'm going back to the God of Israel, I'll put my faith in his hands, then Ruth stood with her. If you think you will persuade your friends or relatives to Jesus by your compromise, you are sadly mistaken. Only a bold stand for Jesus will really do it. When Naomi finally stood for the Lord and went back to the right, that's when Ruth, her daughter-in-law, wanted God in her life. It wasn't while Naomi was hanging out in Moab. It's when she turned to go back to Israel that Ruth said, your God will be my God. Now we'll get that into that part with Ruth's story. I don't want to do Ruth's story yet. I want to keep talking about Naomi. So let's keep talking about Naomi a little bit. Quick note though, do people look at your life and say, I want their God to be my God? I want what they have in their life to be in my life. Interesting thing. Your trust in God and turning toward him in tough times will often be the things that draw others to Jesus when you turn to him when things are going wrong. That can turn them to, the, to him too. Uh, okay, let's read. So that was Naomi walking away from the Lord. Now we see Naomi coming back to the Lord. Verse 19. Now the two of them, Ruth and Naomi, went until they came to Bethlehem. Let me note, this is up hill the whole way, okay? And it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? Okay, small town, okay? Anybody grow up here in the small town, small town, Western Slope? Yeah, everyone knows everything about everybody, okay? Bethlehem is a tiny town. Everyone knew Elimelech and Naomi left, and now they hear, Naomi's coming back. Wait, Naomi? That Naomi? The Naomi who left with Mahon and little Chilean, you know, when they were little? Yeah, the ones that, oh man, how they been? They're coming back? Oh my gosh, right? It's all the talk of the town. They're coming back. They're coming back. They're coming back, right? Is this Naomi? Verse 20. But she said to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. I love this. Coming back to the Lord isn't easy. Sometimes when you've been walking away for a long time, or you left to go into some relationship that you know you shouldn't have or 
a business or you left for the summer to go camping all summer long and then you're finally coming back to the Lord in the, in the fall, right, when camping's closed. Uh, it isn't always easy to come back, to, to make that effort. But Naomi's afflictions brought her fruit because they brought her back regardless of the hardship of it. Now she's surrounded by the questions of others, their curiosity, and most definitely the judgment of some of them. Oh, see, told you you shouldn't have gone and done that. Told you you should Look at now you had no husband and you got no kids. You know, and they're not the, care, the kind that actually care about you. They're just the kind where are like, see, I'm so much better than you because... You walked away, and I didn't because I am amazing, right? Whew, it's hard. But I love, too, that Naomi doesn't sugarcoat her time away. She's not like, oh, yeah, it was great. Boy, I was so warm. Look at my tan, right? God did all this good stuff. No, she's honest in her brokenness. All right, guys, stop calling me Naomi. Now, names, of course, back then meant something, right? Naomi means pleasant and beautiful. Mara means sorrow and bitter so she said please right now don't call me Naomi I don't want to be called beautiful and pleasant because my life is anything but beautiful and pleasant right now it's bitter and the Lord I left full I had a family I came back empty and she's acknowledging her emptiness but she's also back she's back and she needs healing she needs time and as the time goes by we see through this whole barley harvest season that goes God's hand of blessing turns open to her. Because when God says, if you come back to me, we're going to read those verses in a minute from Deuteronomy. If you come back, I will bless you. I will open my hand. You'll be full. You'll be blessed. It'll be amazing. But it has to start slowly. It starts somewhere, right? And I think it's telling she came back at the beginning of the harvest. That means there's nothing in the storehouses yet, but there's going to be, right? Oh, man, it's so cool. Uh... I just want to say a little note for those of you who haven't walked away from the Lord, those of you who have been staying strong with the Lord and through seasons you see friends going and coming back, don't be the little ladies at church who are like, oh my gosh, did you say, I haven't seen them in six months. Where have they been? What have they been? Right? Let's not be those ladies, right? Let's be the ladies who are here at church with open arms. Oh, we've missed you. And not Curious where you've been, what you've been doing, but, oh, it's so good to have you back. It's so good, you know, what can I pray for you for? How can I help you? How can I, you know, can I get your water from the well? You know, being those ladies who are welcoming and opening, recognizing that they're hurting and that it took a lot for them to come back uphill the whole way, right? Maybe they don't want to see you at church the first couple weeks they're back because they know you'll know. You'll know that they were gone. And yet when we see them, instead of that fear of, oh my gosh, what are they going to say? Instead, we're just beaming and those hands of Jesus open-handed. Lord, let that be us. Let that be us. And note that God isn't looking for fake women. You can be honest with your feelings. Naomi was honest with what she was going through right then. Um, We can be too. And our church should be a safe place to heal. All right. All the good of this barley barley harvest in the future chapters start here. Now that Naomi has come back to the Lord and Naomi has come back to the land, God's going to open his hand of blessing and begin to pour it out on her life. It starts with repentance and turning back to Jesus. It starts with honesty accepting your part in your sin and confessing it. And, it. and a difference is made, not only in Naomi's life, but also in the life of Ruth. Because Naomi came back to the Lord, Ruth came back to the Lord. And the Lord is going to do these awesome things, not only in Naomi's life and not only in Ruth's life, but in the life of the whole nation of Israel. He's going to do something amazing. And I'm not going to talk about it tonight. Because it's so entwined with Ruth's story from here on. I feel like if I give you all the details of what happens, and most of you know, right? Most of you have studied the book of Ruth. You know what's coming. But if I give you all the details, then I'm going to have to totally backtrack with Ruth. And I don't want to do that. So we're going to build the story from here. And you're going to see the things that happened in Naomi's life as well as the the things that happened in Ruth's life. Uh... But uh, I do want to say this. By the time we get to Ruth chapter 4, the end of Ruth chapter 4, 
the women of the city are over and over again saying, blessed is Naomi. Look at what God has given Naomi. Look at these. And Naomi's arms are full, not only of figurative blessings, but she's holding her grandson that she never thought she'd have. God fills all of those places that she was missing and thought was gone forever. Because with God, nothing is gone forever. And I love it. It's such a cool story. Yes, Ruth is kind of the the star, but I love this picture of Naomi. We see the emptiness of walking away, but as soon as we come back, the fullness God can bring. Let me read to you really quickly those verses out of Deuteronomy I was just going to tell you about about when the people turn back to God. Still in Deuteronomy 7, it's still this same chapter, and it starts in verse 12. God says this to his people, Then it shall come to pass, because you listen to these judgments, and keep and do them, that the Lord your God will keep with you the covenant and the mercy which he swore to your fathers. Verse 13, And he will love you and bless you, and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb, and the fruit of your land, your grain, and your new wine, and your oil, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flock, in the land of which he swore to your fathers to give you. You shall be blessed above all peoples, and there shall not be a male or female barren among you, or among your livestock." And the Lord will take away from you all sickness and will afflict you with none of the terrible diseases of Egypt, which you have known, but will lay them on all those who hate you. Also, you shall destroy all the peoples whom the Lord your God delivers over to you, and your eye shall have no pity on them, nor shall you serve their gods, for that will be a snare to you. He keeps on going to basically say, God will protect you. God will deliver you. God will strengthen you. You just have to stay with him. The hand of blessing, right? It's kind of fun when you get into those Old Testament parts because uh, God is constantly, uh, he has the people once a year stand on this mountain and on this mountain. It's like Mount Nebal and Mount E something. I don't remember their names. But they stand on it and on the one, the people up there call out all the blessings that God would give the people if they followed him and stayed with him. On the other mountain, they would call out all the curses and all the bad things that would happen if they walked away from the Lord. They're supposed to do that every year so that the people could hear, all right, if I stay with God, all these good things are going to happen. And if I walk away, all these bad things are going to happen. Now, I don't know if Naomi and them originally thought, well, not me, right? Because that's what Satan always tells us. That applies to everyone else but me. God, they they don't know my circumstances. God's word is God's word for everyone, right? I want to read you one last thing, one last thing. This marvelous demonstration of what God can do through a woman who gets it right with him. I'm going to close with these verses from the book of Joel. Joel is one of the Old Testament prophets. His book is like this big, right? It's teeny. He's one of the minor prophets because his book's so small. But Israel has been plagued by judgment. They've been, their land is tore up, right? They have just this awful situation. And it's because they'd walked away from the Lord. But the Lord talks to them about the day when they turn back to him. And so I'm going to read you some of the different verses from Joel. This is chapter 2 of the book of Joel. And I'm going to skip around a little bit. But just listen for a minute, okay? Because I feel like the Lord wants to tell you, some of you in here, come back. I don't know what you're dealing with. Maybe, maybe it's not even a whole walking away. Maybe it's just in an area. Maybe it's just one spot of disobedience where you've been not you know, walking with him. You've been two-faced about thing, something. You've been one way here at church and you've been one way at home, one way on the internet and one way with real people, okay? This is what the Lord wants to tell you. Now, therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, 
a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Do not be afraid, you beasts of the field, for the open pastures are springing up, and the tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and the vine will yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. The threshing floors shall be full of wheat. The vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the crawling locusts, the consuming locusts, and the chewing locusts, my great army which I sent among you. You will eat in plenty and be satisfied. You will praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in your midst. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. Come back, come back, come back to the Lord. He has blessings that you have no idea, and he can restore all those years that you lost wandering in the land of Moab, wandering away from him. He can restore it and he'll bless you tenfold. And not, I'm not even talking just physical blessings like he was blessing Israel, but that blessing within that nothing, no money can buy, the peace and that joy and that fulfillment that is only found in walking with Jesus. Oh, he just wants you back. Tonight, after we pray and close, if you're like in a point or a moment where you just want to come back and you don't know how, come and talk to me. I'd love to pray with you because that's the first step is turning your heart back to the Lord. I'd love to pray with you. Come and see me, okay? Let's pray. Father God, we serve you because you are so full of kindness. Your kindness is what leads us to repentance. We're not afraid of judgment, although we don't want any of those cursings, Lord. We don't want any of those bad things in our life. But that's not why we serve you, Lord. We serve you because your hands are open. And you have so much for us, Lord. You love us. You gave your life for us, Lord, to buy us back from the pits that we dig ourselves into. You are a forgiving and gracious and merciful God. Lord, whether it's been 10 years like Naomi or whether it's been 10 minutes, Father, away from you, we want to come back. We want to walk with you. We want to be women of the word, Lord, who, who, whose lives speak to others. Others want you because of seeing it in our lives, Lord. Jesus, would you, Holy Spirit, show us those areas that we need to, we need to forsake them, God. We need to be your special people. Help us, Father. We can't do it without you. Thank you for being not only <laughs> the one who draws us back, but the enabler, Lord, the one who gives us the strength to walk with you each day. Lord, catch us in our two-facedness. Search our hearts, Lord, and catch us, Lord, in those areas where we sometimes are blinded to our own sin. Help us, Lord, to see them so that we may just turn them over to you. Jesus, you are good, and you are faithful, and you are gracious, and you are amazing, and you are awesome. And that's why we love you, dear Lord. Go before these women this week, Lord. Bless them as you bless Naomi who is walking with you. In your name we pray, amen.